My name is Zihan Jaffa and I will be chairing this session. Um, this session is called uh, Impressions from the Community. Um, I know we promised you people from the next generation. Um, <laughs> but uh, you'd be glad to know that I'm the sole representative from that generation <laughs> for this talk. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, okay, without further ado, we're a bit behind schedule. Uh, the first person who will be giving us some impressions from the community, okay, uh, voices from the ground, is none other than uh, Mr. Sivasoti. I think he requires no further introduction, so without haste, I will, <laughs> I will uh, hand over the mic to him. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to see all of you again. Uh, we have a very interesting guest of honor. He's still outside talking. He didn't run away. Um, so that's wonderful. It gives us a lot of hope. And in this section, we want to mention a couple of things that uh, we are aware of and that we talk about behind closed doors perhaps. And we want to give a bit of airing so that many of the members new to the community will be able to find out about it. So in my section for terrestrial, I'm just going to mention four things. And there are some unruly members of the crowd who will speak up during the Q&A. Because they've had those impressions for a long time and can't wait to speak. So Zian will have a job cut out for her. Now the first is our impressions of Bugitima. We do a lot to promote Bugitima as a rainforest in the city. Uh, we talk about how wonderful it is. The, large numbers of species of trees they can find there. It used to be 800, it's now around 900. Uh, there may be more species of palms there than in the entire African continent. That's changed slightly, Adrian will talk about it later. But it's amazing, right? But sometimes in promoting it so strongly, we may be guilty of whitewashing. People like me might be guilty of whitewashing. So in a third year practical, uh, I renamed the practical Bugitima Patient Under Intensive Care. And uh, Richard Collette, who's a rainforest ecologist, whom I followed up the hill in 1987, says that even that is not an appropriate title. He has more um, disastrous sounding titles instead. So why patient under intensive care? And so the students are introduced to a couple of things. They look at, these are the same students who probably haven't visited the reserve, right? And then they come in and they have a map. And in that map, they look at Bukitima and we say, what cuts it off from the other forest patches? There is Bukitima Expressway separating it from the central catchment. We know now there's an equal link to try and make that connection, but it has been separated for a long time. Then there are condominium developments, rifle range and quarries eating away into this little green patch. Then within the patch, there are paths which are being pounded by many, many feet today. Uh, Fifteen years ago, if you went to Bugitima, may maybe there's a sleepy guard there in the morning, uh, <coughs> probably drooling from boredom, and you see interesting animal life right next to the hut. But now, in the morning, at 6.45 a.m., you might have a problem getting parking. And by 9 a.m., it's Orchard Road at Bugitima. It's not surprising, in 2001 we saw a great interest in nature, so people returned to nature areas the way they hadn't. We just sent out a couple of emails and thousands came to check Jawa. That was mirrored in other nature areas. Our population has grown from that time of 3 million to now beyond 5 million. <coughs> and I must acknowledge, uh, this is Prof Murphy whom you saw. In the opening slide for the coastal cleanup, uh, he actually did studies in Bukitima which are now being dug up for comparisons today. Um, and that was before he was getting muddy even. So population number has increased along with the increase in nature. So it is no surprise that they are pounding the pavement. Now uh, Chatterjee in uh, NIE, she's a geographer, she talked about how the paths have been compacted by this high use. 
in there are many spots where you see resam form a complete cover. Uh, the seed bank has long degenerated, so the forest is not going to recover there. And when you look at scientific papers, uh, when they talk about fragments, they're talking about forests the size of a thousand hectares, and Bukit Timah is around 164. So the students, after putting in all of these impacts, realize that Bukit Timah is a bunch of pebbles. Will it be here tomorrow? The natural history community has known this for some time, even before the huge increase in number of visitors. And the early suggestions of closing off the reserve to visitors were already surprising to me when I heard it as a student. And with these higher numbers, it may be actually an even more urgent call. But when students visit the reserve, we say, look at a couple of things that are going on. And Parks is trying to prevent this degeneration. So you see uh, boardwalks over tree roots. There are actually guidelines about how many people you can bring in. I couldn't bring in a class one year because another school had booked it. So they're trying to control numbers during weekdays. Uh, you see people coming to do forest regeneration studies to figure out how planting must go on. So there are attempts, but this is done quietly without knowledge of the larger community. Can we persist like this? They should know we have a forest that needs a lot of attention and probably money and zonation. So what is this zonation? In Bukitima, screaming kids get off, we're always blaming kids, huh? but <coughs> screaming kids get off the bus and three steps later they're in the forest. And the excitement of being outdoors and with a teacher who can't really keep up because the trails are narrow, right? So if you have 40 kids, they are far, far away. There is peals of joy and laughter permeating the forest. So one of those years when we were kept out of the forest, I snuck in from the edge while my students were in the pipeline and you could hear the screaming all over the place. So then we realized we want to bring them to nature, but there's a struggle in teaching them how to behave within these forest patches. So Sungai Bulo is something interesting that they'll share with you. They are going to have a long walk in so that there is a place to scream. We need a place to scream. And then the core area gets protected. Just now during the tea break, Subraj said there's one more thing I should talk about, which is positive, is that Mabutan, the previous Minister of National Development, uh, actually secured some land around the forest edge to act as a buffer. So he was aware. So this is a little secret that we should begin to talk about within the community. And if there are hard decisions to make in future, it may be something that requires support from the people who understand. It is a very daunting idea to close off a place like Bukit Tima, um, to the public who love reaching the summit. It's something about human nature that they must climb and reach a high point. <coughs> so the second thing I want to talk about is who wants to kill wildlife? So there is conflict with men when we build close to forests. And we have seen problems with long-tail macaques. We have also seen problems with the common palm civet in Siglap and other areas. And you should all be familiar with the conflict with stray cats. They actually have a similar team. If you actually survey people, there's the appearance of a huge problem, right? People seem to want to eliminate animals. But you actually go and study it. So in 2000, AVA did a sample in HDB in Bukit Merah. And they found out that, yes, there are people who are scared of cats. They do cause a problem. If you introduce a management scheme, do you still want them killed? And it turns out that proportion is between 2 to 4%. Uh, John Shah, who's here somewhere, um, he's over there. Yeah, so they did work with Michael Goume and others on the issue with long tail macaques. And it turns out, even with management, what proportion wants them killed? It's a similar minuscule amount. 
uh, waiting who did work with the common palm civet is waiting here okay she's on duty outside she found a similar proportion in sigla the number that wants the animal eliminated at any cost this two to four percent cannot hijack policy decisions or how we are managing animals so the killing has to stop it's not just an animal welfare thing it's a message the ecologists have to send out because the eight species are the animals we are going to be see, seeing as urban communities and these are precisely the animals that can cope with urbanization are the ones that the small proportion have a disproportionate voice in saying they want eliminated so we cannot let that agenda be hijacked so these are the two points I want to make my 10 minutes are over and now I hand over the mic to Zihan thank you everyone Thank you very much, Siva. As usual, that was, it's a, always a pleasure to listen to you speak. Um, I'm not going to take questions right now. Uh, what we'll do instead is we'll let all three speakers go, and then at the end we'll have a 15-minute uh, question and answer session. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Darren Yeo. Uh, Dr. Darren Yeo is interested in um, the freshwater ecosystem, um, but he trained as a carcinologist. He uh, has worked mainly with uh, freshwater crabs as well as some shrimps um, and now he's also looking at uh, invasives in, in our island nation. So um, I'll let Dr. Yeo start. Hi everyone. Thanks. Uh, so uh, I only have 10 minutes so I'll try to make this fast. When I first put this title together, what's going on with freshwater biodiversity, it literally was trying to say, was sort of like, I want to tell you what's going on with freshwater biodiversity. But I realized that uh, if you say in a slightly different intonation, it, it sounds almost like I'm complaining, like what's going on with freshwater biodiversity? So if you're, if you're inclined to think of it that way, no. Okay. So, go with that, huh? Okay. So, oh, okay, so this, re this red line just to remind me, uh, that um, uh, I will actually be mentioning some groups and some organizations that are involved in uh, freshwater biodiversity uh, work in Singapore. Uh, I underline biodiversity because I want to emphasize that uh, there are many other groups that I may not have mentioned that are um, involved in freshwater biology, other aspects of freshwater, and uh, not necessarily biodiversity. So at about 4 a.m., uh, this morning, all I could think of was a few people and a few organizations involved in biodiversity. So, if any of you are here and I didn't mention you, um, uh, you can throw stones at me later. Okay. So, um, yeah, uh, just a very quick intro. I guess I say the same intro to, to this kind of talk most of the time. I think many of you have heard me talk about my old student who, who questioned whether there were freshwater habitats in Singapore. Um, and he found out the hard way there were. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that's, it's surprising that uh, Singapore has fresh waters and uh, many people will consider, well, fresh waters, uh, well, you have lakes, you have streams, waterfalls and all. We don't have waterfalls, but we have lakes, artificial ones. We have streams, yes, we have natural ones. But sometimes people tend to forget that um, canals, reservoirs, ponds, whether they're in a park, whether they're in a golf course, these are all freshwater habitats. So if you have a look at the blue map, PUB's blue map of Singapore, you'll actually see a uh, fair proportion of it is blue uh, and uh, a lot of it is uh, catchment area in fact more than half of Singapore is uh, water catchment area um, so the habitats can be artificial or modified so artificial can be can be nothing there and then you dig a hole and then the water goes in yeah, you're creating a, an artificial habitat or it can be modifying an existing natural habitat okay, so there are various kinds of um, artificial or modified habitats just um, including reservoirs and ponds and canals and rural streams. Um, but also many people are not necessarily aware that we do have some really nice natural uh, habitats uh, in Singapore. They include forest streams as well as uh, freshwater swamp forests. And associated with that is uh, a, a very diverse array of um, uh, organisms. Here I'm just highlighting a couple of groups. Uh, one of the groups are a bunch of things that come under 
sort of natural heritage of Singapore. These are uh, animals like uh, the warty catfish, the harlequin respora, uh, a couple of shrimp, uh, which uh, were described from Singapore. Um, yeah, all of them can be found in neighbouring countries, um, but uh, the the key to this is that they were found and described from Singapore, and some of them are from places that no longer exist. So the harlequin respora was described from I think a stream in Botanic Gardens, and I think. Uh, we will talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, another aspect of uh, the organisms that you find in our fresh waters is that we have a few species that are found nowhere else in the world, and these are known as endemics. Uh, being someone who works on uh, crabs and prawns, the easiest ones for me to pull out as examples are these three species of uh, freshwater crabs that are found in Singapore and nowhere else in the world. So, so just, just a brief introduction to, uh, to freshwater habitats and their associated diversity. And, um, okay, so what's the situation here? There is, so we have habitats, we have diversity. There is also a squeeze. Okay, the diversity, a lot of that native diversity is squeezed into very, very small areas. Okay? Uh, most of it in the Central Catchment Nature Reserve, of course, they, some of them do exist outside, but especially in Nisun Swamp Forest. So, for example, 48% of the fishes, freshwater fishes that we know in Singapore are all squeezed into Nisun Swamp Forest, which is a really tiny little patch uh, between two reservoirs and a couple of firing ranges. So we can thank Mindef for keeping those places safe. 50% um, of our prawns and uh, crabs, decapod crustaceans, also found in these areas. Another um, thing that you would associate with the freshwater biodiversity in Singapore is that we have experienced quite a bit of loss. Okay? Um, again, there have been many species, many groups, but the simple one for me to pull up uh, as examples are fishes and uh, decapod crustaceans. Again, 43% of what we know uh, uh, used to exist here uh, doesn't exist here anymore. Okay? These are locally extinct. Uh, this includes things like this giant fighting fish, which uh, is no longer found here, but I think uh, it's still found in Johor. Yeah, okay, still found in Johor. As well as um, several species of uh, uh, riverine prawns, which no longer can exist in Singapore because uh, cause these animals need to make their way to the sea, or at least their larvae need to make their way to the sea. And uh, nowadays, it's a bit difficult for larvae to go through the barrages and all that to get upstream <laughs> and become adults. Um, so, this brings me to challenges. What are the challenges to conservation and management of freshwater biodiversity? Or another way, simple way of putting it is, what are the threats uh, to freshwater diversity? Um, there are several things, and I could go on and on, but to keep it short, um, loss and modification of habitats. Of course, some of these are, as, as people say, necessary trade-offs. We need water. We need to control floods, we need to worry about mosquito control. But of course, sometimes these things need to be taken with a little bit of uh, uh, thought before we take action. For example, uh, say a pool of water or a stream that's a bit slow flowing, that's running in the nature reserve. Um, and you know in the nature reserve there are fish in the water and the fish will eat mosquito larvae. And so we don't really need to canalize that and throw oil on top and throw pesticides and all that. Lah. Okay. So, um, sometimes you have to look at the context before you start thinking about uh, more drastic methods of uh, mosquito control. Uh, Overexploitation, well this doesn't happen very much anymore. And uh, this obviously is the person who's not at the freshwater area, this Changi Beach. But uh, it's easier to get a picture of someone trying to poach in Changi Beach than in fresh waters. Because in Singapore, all you see is the remains of the campfire after they have gone off. Okay? But, um, so these are just some of the challenges. Pollution, of God, obviously, will always be a challenge for Singapore because our catchment area does go into urban areas, uh, industrial areas. We will always have um, domestic effluent as well as um, uh, urban runoff. Um, the thing that's more interesting to me is alien species. Now, I say alien species, um, alien species with respect to the fact that they are not native but we don't really know if they are having a very strong impact yet. Still, if they are not from here, um, it warrants study. Sometimes the potential for um, harm is there, 
for example, uh, the sting freshwater stingrays that are found in our reservoirs, um, potentially there's some harm there, but maybe the, the, the risk is very low. Of course, most of you don't jump into the reservoirs and go swimming and wading in the reservoirs. Still, the potential is there. But sometimes external forces, um, commercial forces, for example, will actually um, make it a little bit more difficult to manage such issues. So in May 2007, the initial stand of EVA was that pet shops do not sell stingrays. Very dangerous. Okay. Then in March 2010, another article came out. Ah, well, no, just uh, pet shops cannot sell, but fish farms can sell. It's okay, fish farms, uh, because they export, re-export. But of course, if you come to the fish farm, it's all right. Uh, if you know how to handle the stingray, we'll let you buy it. Okay, no problem. Then later, oh wait, they cost quite a lot of money, about sixteen to twenty thousand dollars. Some bad guy had a two hundred thousand dollar stingray. Um, no, I think uh, since August. 2010, AVA has allowed their sale in pet shops as well. So, so it's not necessarily AVA's fault, I guess, but um, <laughs> the, there, there are external forces that commercial interest that, that um, sometimes uh, are part of the necessary trade-offs, I suppose. Okay, so what's happening? These are some of the things you'll be hearing about today in meeting some of these challenges. We don't just sit here idly. There's a whole community of people, as you see here. Um, in what aspects? In terms of research, for example, uh, there have been uh, field surveys, basic field surveys, which are really important. Um, some of the more recent ones have been in the catchment area and in Singapore reservoirs. Um, and they have involved NUS, NPARCS, PUB, NSS, WRS, a whole bunch. Thing. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I have to move faster a bit, okay? So anyway, um, uh, Hyokui will talk a little bit about one of our surveys in the Singapore Reservoirs, and uh, it came out, with, ended up in this um, uh, this journal, Cosmos, Cosmos, not Cosmo. Huh? Okay, um, and then you have another aspect: freshwater biodiversity conservation and management. There are various other groups involved in this: uh, PUB, NUS, NPARC, and uh, it's. There's some research involved in this, but it's a lot more applied. Okay, less, less of the baseline, a lot more applied. It, it, goes, it contributes towards biodiversity enhancement using bioindicators. Uh, and overall, uh, um, uh, conversion, of our, conversion of our waterways into um, something that we can appreciate more okay, in terms of diversity as well as in function. Okay, so there'll be a couple more talks today that will uh, address some of these aspects um, from uh, uh, from NPARCS as well as from uh, TMSI. And then finally, biodiversity education. Uh, books, 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 more books. And there are some courses coming out in NUS, uh, ongoing in NUS as well as in uh, NPARCS uh, that address various aspects of freshwater biology and biodiversity. And these are just a uh, smattering of some of the books that um, some of them directly address freshwater biodiversity, some of them have sections that talk about freshwater biodiversity. So essentially what I wanted to show you, oh yes, and one more talk today uh, will be from uh, Yatin from PUB that will talk about finally we're going to have a book on, or we do have a book on freshwater phytoplankton, something that we don't see very often, um, but it's a very important component of our freshwater. Um, bottom line is I wanted to tell you that, um, that uh, these last three slides show that there's a lot of activity going on in fresh waters and um, that's it, my time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Darren. Okay, our last speaker um, is uh, Ria Tan and again, um, someone that needs no further introduction but uh, while they are setting up, let me just tell you a bit about Ria. Ria came into the scene with almost like a big boom, right? Before that, we didn't know who she was. But in 2000, she appeared and we first met her at Chek Jawa. And ever since then, every single low tide, I'm pretty sure, Ria was out somewhere on the shores of Singapore. So much so that, for example, myself, um, it's very difficult to be without her. So if I have students, I just send them to Ria to find out about things on the ground. So a lot of the students that have passed through our department for the past few years uh, really, really owe Rhea a lot in terms of finding out what's really, really uh, out there. 
So without further ado, Thank Ria. You very much, Lee. Okay, I only have 10 minutes and too many things to talk about. So one of the first things, whenever I talk about Singapore marine biodiversity, if I talk to ordinary people, this is what they will um, say. Okay, if I can figure this out. How do you do this? <laughs> Use the keyboard, which is... Oh, the mouse is here. Ah, oh, okay. They will ask me this, okay? Um, and when, you, when, I tell, uh, when I talk to Singaporeans about marine life, this is what they think about marine life, or maybe this. <laughs> Uh, but fortunately, we know we do have great shores, and then we've heard a lot about Chek Chawa today. And Chek Chawa, as we mentioned, has changed a lot of our lives. And for me, Chek Chawa completely ruined my life. Because this is what I realized after we nearly lost Chek Chawa, simply because we didn't know it was there. If you go out to any shore at high tide, the water is murky, you'll be forgiven to think that there's no marine life. So I decided to make it my personal mission to visit every shore in Singapore at low tide. You know, I, I got every low tide, how long can it take? Two years maybe? So I went to all kinds of shows and they're really amazing. Right now I cover maybe about 40 locations. Uh, it's been seven years and I still haven't seen every show. Uh, one of my favorite shows is Sisters Island. Like many of our southern islands, they have been reclaimed. Sea walls have built around them, but the coral reefs have come back. And marine life is there. Anybody can go out without diving to see all kinds of marine life. Ivan, who's out there somewhere tweeting, saw a sea turtle there. A wild sea turtle just resting in the lagoon. In fact, we have sea turtles. This is Betsy, the resident sea turtle in Pulau Hantu. We even have sea turtles hatching out from East Coast Park. Uh, this is uh, Siva and his volunteer Z was there. You see Z is in the picture with the blue bucket. And they have to rescue the baby sea turtles because they've been disoriented by the urban lights. Uh, <laughs> and um, we also have wild dolphins. They're everywhere, but you have to look for them. TMSI is doing a study and they're asking for volunteers to go and sit on the shore and look for our dolphins. So you can make a difference to do this. We have dugongs. Okay, since this poor dugong died uh, and washed ashore on Tekong, we still have seen signs of dugong feeding trails, even this year, besides Chek Chawa, also Changi and Pulau Sumakau. We also have lots of otters um, at Sungai Buloh, but also other places. And if you see an otter, please share your sighting. Meryl is doing a study on them. Uh, we, all, we have all the major ecosystems in Singapore, and they're very easy to visit. Students, scientists, um, ordinary people, tourists. Um, one of the best uh, ecosystems that I like is seagrass. So Team Seagrass is a collaboration with International Seagrass Watch and NParks, and we cover six locations with Merck at Tuas and two schools at Sentosa and Labrador. We also have great reefs which are very close to the city. Um, actually, we are not just a city in a garden, but also a city in a reef. And the cities which are very far away are even nicer. Uh, Karen will tell us, uh, oh, sorry, uh, the Blue Water Volunteers have been monitoring um, the reef for about the last 10 years, so this is not something new. Uh, Karen will tell us more about it later. Uh, mangroves are really delightful. Uh, they're actually quite, quite colourful with all kinds of interesting mar uh, marine life. And one of the best uh, mangroves at Mandai, and Dan and his team will tell us more about their work there later on. Uh, the Mega Marine Survey is covering all our shores, and this miracle happened because uh, in, during International Year of the Reef in 2008, the Marine Community got together to come up with a blue plan which was presented and accepted by Minister Ma and Minister Yaakob and Siva explained how it, you know, it was very gladly accepted. And this led to the first surveys which started last year and we'll hear more about it later on. Um, there are some, many threats but I have only time for a few. Of course, litter is a big issue. You heard all about it. Most of the shops look very clean because they're clean every day. But if you go to where there are out in more remote areas, the litter can be enormous. Um, fortunately, we have ICCS dealing with this for the last 20 years. And with this experience, SIVA has uh, led this new proposal to, for volunteers to deal with an oil spill if it should happen again. Um, fishing looks pretty harmless until you see the holes that are dug up by fishermen for bait. Uh, abandoned drift, uh, fishing lines can pull up marine life. This bird died because he ate a fish that was stuck on a fishing line on a hook left on a tree. Okay, there's a lot of fish traps being laid on all our shores. The more remote shells have bigger fish traps and more traps. Uh, drift nets are laid on almost all our shores. Um, you know, these drift nets continue to kill as long as they're there because bio plastic is not biodegradable. Dugongs and sea turtles breathe air, they will drown. This has not happened in Singapore yet. We went to Changi recently and we saw a um, net across a dugong feeding trail. A small group of us are trying to collect data on the impact of abandoned uh, drift nets. One of the animals that get caught a lot in drift nets are horseshoe crabs, um, hundreds of them. 
Fortunately, NSS has been studying this and they will be presenting um, uh, findings uh, later on. Um, Singapore has not much land, so a lot of our shores are used for things that um, do make a contribution, a significant contribution to Singapore's economy. So what about what are the shores nearby? Does it impact uh, these activities, impact these shores? Um, for example, Pulau Hantu is right next to Pulau Bukong. Um, there's all kinds of really seriously scary stuff going on there. Yet, um, you know, the shores are so good that Debbie and her volunteers can provide monthly guided dives to the public to see the amazing marine life that's at Pulau Hantu, right next to Pulau Bukong. Pulau Sumakau is also has very nice sea grasses, next, but it's next to Pulau Bukong. Nice uh, coral reefs next to the landfill. It's got lots of marine life, and it's currently the uh, subject of uh, Project Sumakau, which is done by RMBR. They'll tell us more about it later. Um, Tyrene Reef is a one-kilometer submerged reef in the middle of the Industrial Triangle, next to major shipping lanes, and yet it has one of the b most amazing range of habitat, including the best seagrass meadows in Singapore. It's really stunning. A small group of us are trying to raise awareness about it because we're small, we're focusing on bringing um, key decision makers to come and see it, including corporations, and apparently I heard MOS is coming, right? Yes. Good. <laughs> one of the worst things that can happen to a shore is reclamation, and we've lost quite a lot. So have we lost anything recently? Yes, we've lost a small reef uh, near Pulau Hantu. We've also lost some shores at Sentosa. What is the fate of Chek Jawa? This concept plan was revealed in 1990. The plan is to reclaim uh, Chek Jawa at Ubin and uh, to Pulau Tokong, extend the MRT line past, uh, past Sirius so that we can house another one or two million people. Um, Tokong already has approximately that shape. Um, is Chek Jawa protected? Um, in the latest master plan to eight, it has is green in colour, which is park and open space. It does not have that dotted line, and you will notice that the designation does not go past the high water mark, so it doesn't cover the intertidal area. What is our marine nature area? That's the pair of sister islands. Labrador is also a nature reserve, but again, it doesn't go down to the high water mark beyond the high water mark. Uh, Sungai Buloh is protected as a nature reserve, so the mangroves are covered there. It takes a lot of effort and time to get something uh, designated a nature reserve, but the work doesn't end there. And there's a lot of work going on at Bulo right now. We'll hear more about it from Hui later on. So are our, our, our artificial shores dead? This is definitely artificial. And um, I do go to all our shores, and I was very surprised to see how wonderful it is. This shore was severely impacted by uh, the oil spill, which was not cleared up, unlike the recreational beaches. But yet, when I went, these are all recent photos that I took. We still have good marine life there. I even saw an eagle ray. Um, there is a reef that has settled at Ferry Terminal, and Cockshing also checked it out, and all the reefs are still okay. These are all natural stuff that grow even on pontoons. We help Keppel Bay to document the marine life that grow on their pontoons, and this is what I saw. It's natural, free, they didn't pay any money to get this, this uh, marine life. We even have mangroves growing on the seawalls naturally. So all these wonderful, miraculous, free stuff has to come from some place, and it is natural ecosystems nearby. I had a long slide discussing about why we should save our shores and all that, so I got no time, because basically, we still need to answer the first question that anybody will ask you, which is, do we have marine life? Can we, you and I, do something about this? Yes, we can. All you need to do is explore, express, and act. So you just need to go out there and find out what we have. There are lots and lots of activities conducted by a wide variety of people for a wide variety of people at various locations. Just go find out more about it. And after you go, you should share about it. You know, sometimes people say, no one's going to listen to me. But actually, each person has a circle of influence. Talk to your friends, your family, your colleagues. Bring them to see these places. There is this lovely thing called social media that you can go and express yourself. The trouble, however, is... We know Singaporeans are very easy to express when you've got something to complain, right? We are a complaint nation. But if we have nothing to complain about, we don't talk about it. And this can be very dangerous if you want to save a wild place. What do I mean? You need to go beyond complaint letters, okay? See this lovely place. I'm sure all of us would like to visit this place. And I'm sure many of us who have visited this place will talk about it with our friends, might even share it on Facebook. Will any of you write to the government agency who manages this place to say, I had a great time, it's perfect, I don't want to change anything. Not many of us, maybe zero, right? 
But there'll be some auntie who goes there and says, this is pretty boring, you know. Maybe I should write in and tell them they should have more flowering plants. Right? So the agency has got this letter which says more flowering plants. Okay lah, very bad drawing, sorry. <laughs> so there is the more flowering plants, there's a letter, complain, more flowering plants, there's no letter which says no complaint, right? Then if someone says, well, the muddy path is no good, you know, we must have change. There is no letter to say, I don't want any change. Then there's street light. Then there's nobody who says, I don't want it to change at all. There is no... So every time this letter comes up, so at what point are we going to say we want it exactly the way it is? Do we need some concrete proof? Or do we want to wait until it's all gone? All right? So if you want to speak up for a while, places, you need to speak up early, even if you have nothing to complain about. Okay, the best way to, act, to, to save our shores is to act. The best way is to be a nature guide. Because we reach out to all kinds of people, both indoors and outdoors. If you have no time or inclination to be a nature guide, there are many other ways to act. And there's lots more information on Wild Singapore. Thank you! <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to invite our three speakers up to these uh, bright red hot seats uh, for the question and answer session. This is so that everyone can see you guys. Really? Yes. <laughs> Here you go. Okay, um, any questions for any one of them? Can uh, There are four mics at each aisle, so just go to the nearest one and um, tell us who you are. Uh, also tell us who the question is directed to, and then we'll answer. We'll try to answer your questions. The, the question doesn't have to be directed at the speaker. It can be people you see in the audience yeah, as well. Okay, first question. Someone to start the ball rolling for today. Lena wants to answer the question. <laughs> thing to do is why don't you tell the agencies that are responsible and you know uh, uh, pass the information to us because we're constantly asking please you want to connect science with policy but you've got to get to us so that's one and two you have freedom to actually now there's so much blogging <laughs> the, the social media you can go direct to the um, decision makers but I think it's important for uh, scientific and information to get to government agencies, uh, not just end parts, but you know those that are responsible for land use. Or, but I think you, it would come up a coordinated voice if you come and pass the information to end parts. So send your data to us, or you know give your comments. Thanks. I'll I'll add to that. Uh, another thing you can do is <coughs> organize a conference. <laughs> So I, I met one of the marine guys in the corridor and the list of speakers he already had in his head was considerable. So I said, I'll, I'll help you get it organized and it can be done quite easily because th there's so much information and then the conference needs to translate it into a uh, feasible statement. <coughs> so you won the guest of honor when you are delivering that feasible statement. So instead of having him come and open, you could have him come at the end and then do a keynote based on all the submissions. The ideas like that. And you know, this minister is willing to listen. Others, you may have to work harder. But um, that's another way to possibly do it. So I just want to add one more thing. Um, when we do uh, research on BioD in Singapore, we have to um, apply for permits with National Parks Board. And uh, usually one of the things that we do when we get the permit is uh, also we have an agreement to uh, pass on the, the data or share the information that we get from the research back with NPARCS, obviously. Um, so um, that's another way, uh, a, a more immediate and direct way of uh, sharing that, that uh, 
the scientific information back to them. Sometimes they can use it immediately for management. Sometimes uh, it can be uh, kept and accumulated until we have uh, critical mass of information. Uh, I'll just add to Darren's point that our students do research on species biology. We'll hear some of them later. We make them go and present to MPARCs themselves. They're all running around. They want to hear them. So make your permit applicants deliver to stakeholders from government and then they can deliver to public. So they all have to do two presentations after they finish their research. Uh, sorry, F following up on the, um, Darren's point that um, MPARCs has set up a um, database called Biome. And we think that it's not just grabbing data, but we think it's so important. There's so much work done on biodiversity these days. And it's good that we actually centralize it. It doesn't mean that you can't have your database, but you centralize it. It makes it easier for us to actually retrieve the data. Sometimes we, we have a, you know, uh, uh, we need data immediately, and we have to then run around and ask people, do you have data on this or that? But if you have a centralized database, and it's called Biome, B-I-O-M-E, please contact us. Um, at the National Biodiversity Centre. Um, let's give you, you, you write to us, you know most of the people around in NPAS. Do write to us and say we would like to share our data with you. Uh, of course there is this reciprocal sharing um, and of course there's gated kind of access but nonetheless I think we should actually try and, and, and all work together because it's so important. Thanks. Okay, um, thank you very much Lina. Those of you who uh, do not know Lina Chan, there will be very few of you here, but there are some young ones. Uh, Dr. Lina Chan is the Deputy Director of the National Biodiversity Centre um, with NPARCS. Okay. Uh, we also have uh, Jim. <laughs> Jim, you can present yourself. Okay, you, there's a mic there at the back. Ah, okay, great. Um, on the same point, actually, it's important uh, for scientists when you're doing your research to always bear one thing in mind. When you want to use your scientific information to present to uh, authorities, government authorities, so that it can uh, institute policy change, it can drive policy change, the main thing to keep in mind is that when you're doing your research, it's not purely academic research. Always keep the government perspective in mind which means that when you're doing your scientific research on biodiversity, on ecology, on anything that can help us, uh, you, must, you must convey it to the authorities such that they understand how they can use it for management, for management of sustainable development, for management of balance between development and conservation. Sometimes the, the agencies are not so technical. They really don't get the data but they, they want you to clarify how the data can translate into policy for management. There are many, many platforms, uh, including platforms through NPARCS, uh, through URA, um, for, for such uh, data to be useful uh, and where such data can be presented. Uh, but the main thing that you have to bear in mind as scientists uh, is that there must be some element when you convey uh, this data, uh, uh, which is, uh, easily digestible by the agencies so that they can apply it for management. They love to use this data, in fact, and they are, they are, on, their, they are on our side. They are, they, are, they are really not antagonistic, yeah, but, but they have to get it and you have to help them analyze it. Thank you yeah. very much, Jim. Um, okay, uh, if you would require further discussions for that, I uh, would uh, prefer that you approach the speakers and Dr. Lina Chan or uh, Jim uh, Lam uh, during the key break uh, session later. Do we have a second question? Yes? Hi, my name is Josia. Um, a few months ago, I went for a very interesting seagrass tour at, Kam at Tanjong Kupang in Johor which was actually conducted by a secondary school student's environmental club from the local villages. So these are actually kids from a low-income community, but they were being helped by a PhD student from, I think it was UKM. But um, I was wondering if there's any similar things 
in Singapore where uh, local communities, especially young people from at the school level, are being encouraged to take ownership of the natural uh, reserve areas that are nearby the communities. We are redirecting the Karen Teo. You don't have to know the answer, you just have to know who can answer it. Well, I'll cover that later during my 10 minute presentation. Yeah. Or we can chat during tea break. Yeah. I would just say there, there is always an effort. But the thing about schools, they tend to want to do one thing one year and then another thing the second year. So the problem that a lot of us face is how do you create a sustained program? Uh, with a long-term thing. So in International Coastal Cleanup, you saw there are 70 organizations, but very few of them want to go to the same area the following year. So it's, it's a conflict between um, educational opportunity, entertainment, and contrib contributing sustainably. So that's a message we do try to sell, uh, and there are few successful programs which have a long-term commitment. But do you know if you launch a program the first year, the media will be excited. And then the subsequent years, they get bored with you. So if you need media publicity to sustain a program, doing the same thing year in, year out, uh, will it's, it's a struggle to get media attention. So International Coastal Cleanup 20th year, I actually don't bother trying to get media, so we are immune to that effect. And that's a big challenge that we have with trying to get people to take an interest in some of these sites. The exciting thing about some of the marine sites that Ria showed, if you're involved there, say it's, maybe it's a cleanup, you can see the ecosystem recovering, and then you can diversify the kind of things you do. It's a bit of a hard sell now, and usually when you find the right teacher, suddenly happen, everything starts to happen. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, sorry? Karen? Yeah. I think it's also a matter of knowing what's out there in the schools, uh, and leveraging on initiatives that MOE has started off. Um, MOE is going more outdoors these days. Um, later on in my presentation, I'll talk to you about some of the collaboration that we are doing with MOE that give us a wider reach uh, to these young people, the next generation. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. One last question for the, the team of speakers here. Anyone? Yes, Sajong. Hi, I'm Tai Chong. Uh, just, well, not the one last question, but maybe two. Uh, first of all, will being, well, it's always very easy to sell to people the conservation of um, charismatic species, your dugongs, your dolphins, whales. But how do we approach people, you know, to conserve areas that are, you know, more fundamental, like your coral reefs, for example. They are pretty uh, colorful, but they're also important. They are foundation of the marine ecosystem. So how do you approach this group of people who are just attracted by, whoa, you know, cute little cuddly animals? And second part of the question will be really uh, to bring up the debate on captive animals for conservation. So how far should we do it? How, what, what are the governing rules? What are the rules set by well, the government agencies? How, to what extent is it right? To what extent is it wrong? You know, things like that. Thank you. No, I, I'm just, what, what, what do you mean with captive animals for conservation? Well, um, the main debate will be really like X, the... X2, isn't it? Uh, well, just keeping, buying animals, keeping animals in oh, general. Okay. No, not, not, not talking yeah. about like... Well, well maybe not... Not talking about reintroduction or anything like that. Uh, not introduction, but it's more of like, well, on the stand that, you know, you are bringing animals, but co conservation to study their behavior, things that you really can't have in the field, for example. Oh, okay, all right. His first question was, if you're interested in a habitat which uh, may not be as exciting as a big-eyed panda. La. So, we all like to play dirty, so we, sh the coastal cleanup, we show all the dolphin and the dugong and the sea turtle, and then they go there and just mud and all that, but... <laughs> Um, so we use that to draw it in. It's not just us. International communities, you know, WWF uses panda for a good reason. Um, the otter is a great symbol of wetlands because it's very lovable. 
So this is not a fair game. Uh. You have to use every dirty trick in the book. Okay. So yeah. when I go and give my international coastal cleanup, do you know about marine life? I, I opened third slide and RGS was turtle, then the girls all nearly fainted and then got dugong and and then I slip into showing photos of habitat. Uh, while Singapore's got a lot of stuff, I just pulled down Changi. I talked about sea cucumber and they seem to feel sensitive to the sea cucumber still. <laughs> so um, yeah, com uh, reef should have no problem. There's so many wonderful I, things I, to see. I I think just maybe um, just following up on on like simple guiding principles when you're dealing with public also um, appeal to something that they can relate to lah. So you know, like I said uh, last time, I was helping with the guiding and all that. Um, if it's a bunch of um, young kids, you know, you talk about things that gross them out. No, very disgust things that you no, know, they go ee, but they are actually very fascinated. So then you tell them uh, about how how the you know how um, something can gulp something else down. You know, the whole mouth can engulf it, or something can eviscerate and all that. Oh, little kids like, grossed out, but they like it. You no, know? they say, oh, I want to know more. Then you no know, teenagers, older ones. Maybe you talk about how what kind of funny courtship did these animals have, and all these kind of weird things. Like barnacles have very long things, and you know. Then they'll get very excited. Oh, barnacles! Uh. Then the older folk, of course, you know, it's only one thing to talk about food, lah, right? So oh, this one can eat, this one can eat. Then you listen to the uh, the uncle who tell you, hey, you know, last time I tell you this one can eat. Uh, then you yeah, listen. Then you get them to start talking and and all that. But okay, that's for guiding, lah. But I guess generally you try to relate to something that they're more uh, that you know try to look at the the target audience and and uh, uh, bring it more to something that they can relate to, lah. Alright, so that's, that's it. Okay, and the second question on uh, on the use of uh, captive animals to study or for conservation. Okay, I think, um, so I'm not sure what you're alluding to. Maybe you're talking about uh, 500,000 fish for RWS or something. But uh, in modern zoos and aquaria, uh, they have to demonstrate some kind of public education or conservation value to what they are setting up. So EU has guidelines, it's really thick. And then so they, they all adopt this practice. The second thing they do is because they need to generate PR and win people over to support their cause. Um, um, the motivation of someone building uh, a huge development, it's about making money. So, you know, that's just the reality, right? So, the reality is their motivation is to make money. Then whatever they can do to bring the visitor in, uh, they will do it. So most of the discussion is uh, quite meaningless. It's up to us to figure out what to make uh, of it. So whether a captive area can produce um, education or inspire activism or something better, well, we take our first year students to the zoo, the Singapore Zoo, every year. I actually don't like the scene of a captive animal, so I stay outside while 200 students go in. But I know it's a critically important experience for them. They've been to the zoo when they were young. They never go again. And they can't go because no Halloween, right? <laughs> then, <laughs> then they go. So with the first years, we wanted to cancel that field trip because we say, how much are they learning? But they're really excited. And so we send, it, send them to the zoo just before the exam. It also calms them down. And... The TAs talk about the animals and the biology and the role in the region and in Southeast Asia and, and the zoo is helped by funding conservation locally and regionally and then we can talk about the kind of programs and, and then that awakens their... Not everyone is going to care about something they don't know. So the zoo is a teaching tool. I probably couldn't do without it. And one of our students here uh, went on to go and work with Wang Siu Ti in... Sunbear Conservation Centre in Borneo and he learned husbandry skills while he was a part-timer at the zoo and when they went there, this is a PhD student who wants to do something um, they are rescued seized animals and their husbandry skills of the three of them who are all former part-timers at the zoo turned out to be critical and then they stayed on and they helped build a volunteer mechanism uh, with their IT skills so I think they can play a critical role it's how, what you make use of it. Lah. Some things you can try and resist, but if it's here to stay, then how do you make the most of it? Okay, anything to add, Darren and Rio? 
Okay, um, thank you very much. Let's give our three speakers another round of applause. Thank you very much. That concludes our first session, Impressions from the Community. So um, now I would like to uh, yeah, hand over the mic to uh, the forest session. Uh, this will continue until lunch break. Okay, please welcome Ding Li, everyone. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Ding Li. Um, just a bit of an introduction. Um, I'm not used to speaking for my. I'm a full-time teacher. I am with National Junior College, uh, and uh, I've been involved in Nature Society for a few years. Uh, well, actually, I would better describe myself as a part-time teacher and a part-time ecologist because I spend a lot of my time in the forest. So, uh, for today's session, unfortunately, one of our uh, my co-chair uh, Cheng Pui, who is from Rascal School, she he's not the able to join us because of a sore throat, a uh, common uh, medical condition with teachers. So uh, instead of him being around, uh, he would have given you some cool insights. Uh, Siva will be my co-chair. So um, without further ado, I'm going to start um, introducing the first speaker. The first speaker is going to talk about um, a very interesting uh, project that has been happening in Singapore for the last few years. Uh, some of you who have been following up with the press, you might have heard a little bit about the EcoLink. Um, the EcoLink is very meaningful for me because uh, I am a primarily a conservation guy and I'm interested in how fragmentation affects um, all kinds of animals from birds to mammals. So uh, EcoLink is a really interesting project because it's the first attempt um, in any Southeast Asian country, to my knowledge, whereby the authorities are actually actively trying to reconnect uh, forest habitats that have been previously fragmented. And uh, although the bridge, so to speak, is not built yet, um, there are ongoing surveys and uh, the surveys I'm sure in the next few years will review some interesting results. Um, without any further ado, I shall invite the first speaker, uh, Delphine, to give you an idea and some updates on what is going on at the eco-link. Delphine, please. So uh, this is the biggest audience I've ever seen. Um, so uh, my talk is, uh, who will cross the road? So like basically besides humans, who else are actually using the roads? So this really cute picture actually was taken by one of my colleagues at N Park. Uh, he actually saw this crossing in uh, Rifle Range Road. And after the mother and baby pangolin actually crossed the road, uh, a car went by. So few seconds earlier, this thing could have been a pangolin pancake. So those are not the only animals crossing the roads. So we also have mammals, small and large, like rodents, um, rodent small animals, uh, large ones like mouse deer, samba deer. We have birds who can't actually cross uh, roads because they are forest dependent. There's reptiles, monitor lizards, snakes, and uh, arthropods like butterflies, Mos uh, not mosquitoes, <laughs> um, spiders, so on. <clears throat> okay, so very quick outline of what, uh, what I'm going to talk about. So why the Ecolink at BKE? Um, the monitoring surveys, why do we need them? Where are they held? What types of surveys we have? And uh, methodology and results of two surveys that I'm going to go a little bit into detail. Okay, so why do we build the Ecolink? So it's to connect the two nature reserves, the Central Catchment Nature Reserve and the Bukit Timah Nature Reserve with uh, the Ecolink. And it allows safe movement of animals across the road so they don't, get, they don't become roadkill. 
um, so why do we need them? Small fragments of our forest, and you know, uh, the B Bukit Timah Nature Reserve is actually very small, results in fewer animal species, and they actually have a tendency to result in degeneration. So a connection actually would have a positive impact on biodiversity, especially since uh, the Bukit Timah Nature Reserve has been isolated from the central catchment. And uh, so detailed and long-term studies are required to make sure that the, to check that the ecolink is actually doing what we intend it to do. As to where it's held, obviously it's in the vicinity of the ecolink. So the uh, ecolink will be here, this little red dot, across the BKE. And so it will connect the Bukit Timah Nature Reserve and the central catchment. So we have actually found that Dairy Farm Nature Park is actually a bu important buffer zone for uh, animals like birds so that they can actually feed on uh, some of the fruit, a lot of the fruit trees there. Uh, okay, then central, central catchment nature reserve. <coughs> so the types of uh, monitoring surveys we have, so there's the arthropod, that means we actually do transect surveys for those targeted to small mammals, that's for pitfall trapping, mark and recapture, large mammals, spotlighting, camera trapping, and uh, bird, bird surveys, which are transact surveys, mist netting and bending. So who are involved in this? There's NTU undergraduate students, NUS, uh, the Raffles Museum of Biodiversity, the Nature Society of Singapore who do the, the vertebrate study group and the bird study group, and volunteers from the public, okay? As well as NPAP, obviously. Um, all right, so methodology and results of the two surveys that I'm going to go into. So bird banding. We catch these birds in a mist net caught on either side of the BKE. So we bend them with unique numbers by trained staff. So actually, I'm not the one doing it, okay? My colleagues are. Uh, measurements are taken and released. So, hello, bird. Okay, so like these are forest-dependent species, like the cream-vented bubble, a uh, forest-dependent species, and if the BTNR and CCNR were to degenerate further, they would be severely impacted. And the Asian fairy bluebird, uh, my colleague was very happy when we caught this. That's the first time he actually managed to. Okay, now it's a very rare catch because this is actually a canopy bird. And the red crown barbet, it's uh, very loud, noisy, and it attacked my colleagues a lot. Oh. Okay? <laughs> oh. Yeah. So, yeah, that was Krish. Uh, all right. So, so far, there's been no forest dependent species have been determined to be moving between the BTNR and CCNR. Though, actually, some birds do move around in within the, the nature reserve. So, this is actually uh, the little spider hunter has been caught three times. <coughs> it's been moving back and forth between Dairy Farm and uh, Bukit Timah side of the Ecolink. So we've also found out that the Dairy Farm Nature Park yeah, has been is an important nature uh, habitat and feeding ground for many forest dependent birds as well as migratory birds. So and this is the other fun one which is camera trapping. <coughs> so we actually have two sites and a control site. So one site on either side of the BKE and one further in in the central catchment. We have about 100 plus cameras placed in a 50 meter grid and we do it all by hand with volunteers. Uh, who wants to volunteer? <laughs> yeah, so for, accurate, so for accuracy in occupancy modeling, we actually have to have more than 100 cameras. All right, so why? Well, it's non-intrusive monitoring. We don't have people standing there and interrupt, interrupting the animals or disturbing them. It allows round the clock and long periods of time for monitoring. This is all battery dependent, so we don't actually have to put a power source there besides the AA batteries. Though it's contingent on whether the illegal poachers and anglers would come and take it away, which, one, which happened once. Okay. So what we found so far, interestingly enough, is that we actually saw a sighting of one Malayan pangolin in the Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. That species has been thought to be uh, extinct on the mainland. Okay? So everyone was having a huge party as soon as they found that. Yeah. 
That's the Malayan porcupine. Okay, uh, civet cats. We have 20% uh, have been found. 20% uh, of the cameras have uh, spotted civet cats, while in the CCNR site, only four. So you can already see that if we would have the eco link, we could actually allow movement. There's zero in the the control site. Yeah. Okay, that one was staring at the camera. <coughs> Pangolins, 20% uh, of the cameras in CCNR uh, saw pangolins, while compared to seven, seven cameras in BTNR. And mouse deer, that was an interesting one. There was zero seen in BTNR. Three cameras captured uh, the mouse deer, though it's probably the same one since the cameras were in the close vicinity and almost 50% of the cameras in the control site were caught all the mouse deer. Yeah. That's the, one of the few pictures we had in the daytime. This was about, yeah, at about 10.30 in the morning, under dense cover, okay? And Samba deer, neither, in neither of the Ecolink uh, sites, but in the control site. Okay, this is like huge. Wow, that was fast. All right, <laughs> to <laughs> summarize, um, the Ecolink at BKE will actually improve animal movement between BTNR and the CCNR. Uh, together with our partners, M Parks is committed to conducting long term field surveys before, during, and after the Ecolink construction. So, we have some encouraging preliminary results. We discovered species thought to be extinct. And we also can determine the distribution abundance of cryptic mammals. All right, thank you. Wow. Thank you for the very uh, insightful presentation. Um, in fact, if you need a volunteer, you have found one standing here. <laughs> um, our next speaker uh, will be going to, she'll be touching on uh, something that is, um, the emphasis is not so much on science, but uh, in rather uh, on communication. Uh, and Karen Teo from the National Parks Board, um, Central Catchment Nature Reserve, she will tell us uh, a little bit more about uh, her work, uh, about how she has involved various schools uh, and other institutions in uh, conservation and nature education. Uh, Karen Teo, please. Thank you, Sing Lee. Uh, good, very good morning to everyone. I see a lot of familiar faces. So um, I'm here to talk about why nature rocks. I think uh, living in a very urbanized country like Singapore, we are the converted lots. That's why you're here. So there's a large portion of population that's not here. They are the non-converted lots. And they're the ones that we need to tell them why nature rocks and why it is important to go, go outdoors. Yeah, um, I will talk a little bit more about how um, some of these programs that we've had, uh, that we are currently running, has evolved through the years. So it starts off with Bukit Timah. Now, earlier on, Siva spoke about um, Bukit Timah being a very precious precious patch of tropical rainforest. I feel passionately about it too. Um, but it's, um, it's important to... He, he said it's double-edged sword because we, have, we keep telling about it and then we, uh, we have more people visiting it. So it's like a double-edged sword. But we cannot stop people visiting it. We cannot. Um, and in conservation, other than learning a, uh, learning a little, little bit more about our biodiversity, I think it's also important to share all this information to the general public so that we garner more support to help protect our precious natural heritage. So basically, I'll just share with you what are some of the things that we do. Uh, I work in the forest. Uh, when I go out with my friends, you know, my, friends, my husband's friend will usually ask me, oh, yeah, especially if they meet me for the first time, where do you work? And park. Oh, and park. Wow, beautiful garden. Oh, where's your office? In the forest. The first question they tell me is, ask me is, Singapore got forest man. <laughs> Singapore got forest man. I was shocked when that person asked me that question because to me, yeah, duh. But to her, is no. 
There's no forest in Singapore. Well, we have the two largest nature reserves in Singapore are terrestrial habitats, and they contain beautiful trees and forests and biodiversity. So Bukit Timah is one of them, and Central Catchment. When I show this picture to schools, the reply or the response I get is, and then the first question, is that Singapore? Yes, it's Singapore. Okay, Singapore has forests. Okay, so we have forests, but is there really anything out there in the forest? Seriously, you know, maybe it's just trees, nothing much. We've got lots, actually. Uh, my colleague from the National Biodiversity Center has done research out in forests, and some of these that they've done research in are not even the reserves. Uh, they've done it in other nature areas. And if you could look at this survey, which we've done from 1991 to 1997, within this, this is one of the earliest surveys that we've done, um, we found 10 species not known to exist in Singapore, and 30, 13 rediscovered species. So that to me, when I first read it, as an ex-teacher, I, I don't know these information. So I came to MPARCS and I read about this, I was like, wow, you mean we have all these things? Then, Within a period of one year, they found this many. That to me is wow. And this is what we've had listed down in a report which we sent to CBD. It's also a wow. Look at these numbers. You wouldn't expect these numbers to even represent Singapore, but they do. These are numbers representing the things, the, the flora and the fauna in Singapore. Okay, now. I've convinced you that there's forest in Singapore and yeah, there's something out there. So what is NPARC doing to help people see all these things or learn a little bit more about our natural heritage? I'll begin with two dates, 1995. Initially, I had a few more slides, you know, talking about some key things that happened in 1995. Uh, if that was the year where Kobe had a very terrible earthquake, but this is also the year that Bukit Timah started its very first outreach activity. Okay? The other year that I'll show you is 2001. I also googled to find out what's so important about this year globally. iPod was launched. <laughs> so was Wiki, Wikipedia. But this year was also very important for Bukit Timah because this is the year when uh, Bukit Timah started its volunteer program. Okay, so this is 1995. The very first outreach activity that we did in Bukit Timah was guided walk. So our focus then was communication, communicating to people, educating them about what we have. Then in 2001, we started our first uh, volunteer, no, our volunteer program in Bukit Timah. Then when we first started, we only had around 20 volunteers. Okay, very small, but they helped us with guided walk, pulling out weeds. Um, and doing nursery work. Now, in 2011, it has increased 104. My math's not very good. I think it's 104. Yeah, there about, thanks. 203. And as I speak right now, there is a volunteer orientation happening at Sungai Bulo with 60 volunteers who sign up to volunteer in Bukit Timah and Central Catchment Nature Reserve within a period of two months. That means we have volunteer orientation once every two months. So the last one we had was two months ago. So this today at Sungai Bulo, when we are orienting these people, there are 60 of them who actually sign up as volunteers. That to me is very encouraging. So I think all of you who've done great work at reaching out to people, people like Ria, Siva, and even some of the teachers that I see here that I know, you've done great work because these people are actually starting volunteering starting to do something more active. Okay, so, um, what is the span of activities that we do have there for, for the general public, the so-called non-converts? Um, for the active, like I've mentioned, we have a um, volunteer program where our volunteers are involved in guided work. This is LaShawn. He's in the news quite often. He started volunteering with us when he was nine. Uh, nine years old and he started doing guiding. Okay? He was passionate, really, really passionate. Up till now, he's still volunteering, but he has uh, moved from guiding to taking photographs, helping us do documentation. 
Okay, so he is seen here guiding the younger generation, helping to influence them. Um, our volunteers also help us with monitoring projects in the forest, uh, monitoring our, our reforestation plot, monitoring our uh, ecoling surveys, insect surveys, our birds. Uh, they help us remove invasive species. We've got lots of them along the fringes. Um, but we work in tandem with partners. So we have schools coming in, helping us to remove, and then we get partners to sponsor to plant. Okay, so that's what we do. One, one group will remove, another group will plant. Uh, we have volunteers doing restoration work for us. This guy over here is Ki Ming. I'm not sure if he's here. Maybe he's not. Yeah, Ki Ming is one of our oldest volunteers. He's close to 90, if I'm not wrong. And he's there doing this. So, like what I think Ria or, or Siva was it? One of you was saying, um, seriously, it spans. Oh, oh no, it was Darren. It spans all ages. Was it you? Or oh, MOS? So I had so much information overload today, I can't remember who said what. Uh, okay, nursery work and our volunteers, we provide them with training in order to ensure that they are out there telling the right things, sharing the right information. We give them that training. Uh, other than volunteer work for schools who has very enthusiastic teachers, uh, RGS is one of them. Um, we have Woodgrove. Uh, ACS has been our volunteer for seven years. Every single year, they'll bring badges of students to our area to help us clear invasive species. So they will come and they will help do what we call uh, help us in our habitat restoration program, either in parent parenting young plants, removing rasam, smilax, um, planting, okay, or, or, or just being there to help us um, improve on some of these degraded lands. Okay, so for those who are teachable, so those of you who are active, these are some of the activities you can do. Those of you for the teachable, we have, okay, this I have to do very fast. Okay, when we, when we develop programs, we thought about the journey of a child when a child is out from the womb. Okay, so nature education for a child that begins at the very beginning when he or she could start walking should be exploratory. So we've developed a series of programs that when you have kids, you might want to put them in from the very beginning to the end. So this is using art to influence the really, really young ones, um, preschoolers. Um, this one is leveraging on MOE's initiatives. They have a, a program for active learning initiative where we hop on board and we uh, sell our programs and get children to come outdoors. Okay. This is another one. Now, it's our young volunteer program. We realize our volunteer program uh, caters more to the adults. So because of that, we, we started a young volunteer program where youngsters could come and learn a little bit more about the forest and gradually be uh, older volunteers when they grow older. Okay, Kids for Nature, this is also another program in collaboration with MOE. Um, this is good work done by a wonderful lady, Bing Chak. I saw her just now. Is she here? Yeah, so this, she started together with us the first field study center in Singapore, helping children to go outdoors to learn more about the outdoors so that they will learn to protect the outdoors. Okay, teachers workshop, and for the men on the street, we'll have guided walks. Uh, so basically, in a nutshell, we have progressed from just communicating with people to participation, encouraging people to participate. So in the latest thing that MOS was mentioning, community in nature, uh, the main aim is to really help people to learn about nature, explore nature, appreciate nature in their own backyard before they, because not everyone can go to the nature reserve. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm back because Ching Pei couldn't make it. <laughs> so I'll give Ting Li a hand. Okay, our next speaker is um, Mr. Kwek Yen. Future Dr. Kwek Yen. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Kwek Yen obviously is a botanist because uh, today what he's going to do is tell us why exactly someone would want to be a botanist. Okay. There's not many of us here would like, who would like to, so Kwege is going to enlighten us and maybe, <laughs> and maybe uh, affect the future generation. I know there are some young undergraduates here who might be interested. 
Okay, yeah, dumb. Yeah. dumb undergraduates, yeah. Okay, hi, uh, good morning, my name is Craig Yen. I'm from the Applied Systematics Laboratory. So usually when I start off uh, my presentation in conferences or, or symposia, I usually have to spend one or two sentences explaining why is it that a student from a plant systematics lab is not really doing plant systematics? But today I actually get to spend the entire presentation talking about this. Uh, our, in the plant lab, we have actually moved on from being uh, producers of uh, and contributors of plant systematics research to becoming end users of this uh, systematics research that is still going on very active in the region and around the world. And we actually translate this into for use uh, in Singapore. Uh, the the labs. Uh, principal investigator. Today I'm presenting on behalf of the lab, so this is not about myself, this is about all the projects that go on in this lab. The principal investigator is uh, so Associate Professor Hu Tan. Uh, many of you will know him. So his predecessor, uh, Dr. Sean Kim, who passed away recently, uh, yeah, he's the, the predecessor of the lab. So actually produced the concise flora of Singapore. Okay, and uh, Dr. Ian Turner, who when he was in Singapore, he also collaborated with uh, Prof Tan in producing a uh, checklist of uh, Singapore's vascular plant species, and then the first red list of Singapore. And uh, Prof Tan has continued this work to producing the updated uh, 2008 Singapore Red Data book, uh, where he contributed to the vascular plant species. Uh, this is the latest checklist, which I'm always very embarrassed to show, because yeah, my name is there. Uh, the moment this checklist was out, we got uh, very fast, not so furious feedback that there were uh, mistakes and all that. And I promise you that we will be updating this checklist once I'm done with my PhD. Uh, and this checklist is different from the past because we actually try to incorporate all the natives, uh, not just the, uh, the extinct ones or the endangered ones that are listed in the Red Data Book, but also the common uh, native plant species. We also try to include as many of the exotics uh, that are uh, occurring in Singapore as possible, including those that are only cultivated and those that have escaped from cultivation, and those that have spread into uh, the forest, established wild and self-supporting po populations uh, out in the, in the uh, wild, more wilder areas. And we have also created this, uh, this group of species, which we are not really sure whether they are native or not, and we have made this clear. So, uh, uh, Prof Tan is also recently has moved into other things photosynthetic, such as algae, uh, and this is Min, uh, um, uh, our graduate student who has moved over from the molecular biology side, and she's looking into ultrasound, ultrasound purification of algae uh, in our freshwater uh, reservoirs. So this is one of the offshoots of the project, and there are, uh, the, lab, the the lab will continue to. Uh, produce floristic work. Yes, uh, for Singapore and for <laughs> other specialized users, such as this is the flora of Samarkal, um, produced uh, together with uh, Ron Yeo from Project Samarkal. So, um, but uh, I'll take this opportunity to also highlight and um, uh, we are bringing the flora online. Uh, this is the Flora of Singapore online website. Uh, it's actually a WordPress blog. So what we're trying to do is, you know, often when you try to ID a plant, you try to search for the species and try to search. Hello. Do I get extra two minutes for this? Yes, I do, right? Yes, okay. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, and anyway, so we, we try to, uh, when we photograph, a, uh, we encounter a plant species, we, we learn it. We try to upload the photos together with its names on this blog so that to help the, uh, anybody else who wants to learn about Singapore flora so can search for this online, Flora of Singapore Online. And we hope that this is a community project so that man many other amateur botanists like us out there and many experts, we hope that you can come on to this blog, comment, let us know what embarrassing mistakes we have made uh, or what, what you know this species so that we can continue to contribute and share this uh, with the rest of the community about the plants and how they interact with uh, other organisms. So uh, the, the lab continues to be grounded in 
botanical and floristic research, but then we're also moving into ecology and horticulture, as many of you will know. Uh, in particular, let's look at Singapore's uh, assemblages. We, you've heard of past speakers talking about... <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, you've heard of past speakers talking about uh, the forest in central catchment. We also look at other kinds of things in the landscape. Uh, humans have impacted our uh, landscape throughout the world okay, by deforestation, but we have also moved species around, such as plants and animals. This whole Singapore is an example of such a case. Uh, this is what Singapore looked like in, a, in the past with lowland rainforests as well as some uh, swamps of different kinds. And these black areas are uh, non-vegetated areas today. And you also have yellow areas, which are managed vegetation, which is grass and lots of uh, streetscaping and plantings, which are mainly exotics. And you also have young secondary forests, uh, bits of them all over the island, which are also dominated by exotics. And, not, and only a bit of it is actually old growth or na native dominated forest. So this, this map is produced by Alex, whose shape you can see here. Uh, he produced it by putting it all on GIS. And this has allowed us to in, in find it, find the but a finer detail about the spatial distribution of uh, all these forests. For example, this year we're having honor, uh, our honor students, uh, Louise here in a very feminine position, and uh, Carmen taking a drink after few work. Uh, they're looking at Singapore was once all covered by rubber plantations. So where are these rubber plantations now? Some of them have been cleared, and they're regenerating, and they're dominated by what you know as uh, acacia, or spatodia, and African tulip, and so on. So we want to see the percent of them have been abandoned intact with the rubber tree still there. So we want to see how to plant assemblages actually vary with age since abandonment in these two kinds of forests. And we also have uh, students looking, okay, honor students looking into uh, how exotic plants actually establish and spread into these forests. And this is uh, Mark here looking very odd at his study subject, which is the Socropia. Uh, it's a neotropical pioneer species which has associations with uh, ends back in the neotropics, and uh, we are seeing how it's we're trying to quantify the spatial, uh, the rate of spread, and how maybe it impacts our own native pioneer species that are also uh, interacting with our native ants. And this is a very successful project from last year, honors project. This is Hazel, you can see a, a poster outside, and she has looked at how the MacArthur's palm, which is a very, very commonly planted multi stem shrub in today's urban environment, how its seedlings have actually spread into all these uh, forests. More stuff, let's look at the other more applied areas where we have research projects going on. And this is uh, from the Urban Greenery Studies Project. Yes, uh, as you can see, Suyang used to be from the Marine Bio Lab. There's uh, no question about it, uh, where, his, where his interest lies now. And this is actually. <laughs> is a very hardworking assistant, uh, as you can see, uh, Ife, and they're actually lo looking into the uh, role of urban, urban greenery in uh, actually uh, as a, that affects epiphytes and butterflies and bird species. So they have 43 transects and six study sites, and they're trying to see how the maintenance of such greenery in the urban environment and the planting of plants actually uh, affect these. And this is the, uh, another theme, okay, uh, the team that tries to look at how to, instead of planting exotics, you try to plant native uh, species in our, our landscaping. This is Alvin, as you can see, he's a very important person in our lab, okay? And there's no question who Weefong wants to be when he grows up. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, Chao Kun, a uh, very strong guy, but he really can carry things for nuts. And uh, this is uh, Pacin, uh, looking very scary. And this is Beatrice, looking like she just woke up. Now these guys actually, they, we want to plant native plants in our, uh, our urban landscape, but first we have to research which are the ones that can grow. So they actually do germination experiments, try to propagate the plants through stem cuttings, root cuttings, and they try to see the success rate and the rate of growth. And they actually do demonstration plots like this along Pertil Road as an example of streetscaping with 100% native plants. Uh, this is Hot Park, 100% uh, uh, native plant garden, and uh, this is a before and after shot of the area outside the university hall. You can see that they are planting native trees all over NUS today. So, uh, they are actually monitoring the growth of these trees, and they want to see uh, how whether when you plant these native species, how much does it actually benefit biodiversity as well. 
and minimize risk to native uh, ecosystems because you reduce the risk of exotics that escape. And you also help to conserve uh, our botan botanical and genetic resources through these, all these fun things. So I hope I you a uh, rundown of the, of the projects that we have. Uh, it's very interesting laboratory and how they're all uh, really grounded in botanical and uh, floristic research. And uh, the, the plant lab has many people to thank. Too, need too many for me to try and rush through now uh, at this point in time. So I'll just leave to you to read through all these slides yourself. And uh, many of you are actually listed up there. So to, on, on the behalf of uh, Associate Professor Hugh Tai, thank all of you for your attention. Thank you, Craig Yen, for your very uh, interesting presentation, which has given us a lot of uh, new information on plants in Singapore and also uh, shown some interesting postures of your fellow lab mates. Um, we will now move on to the next speaker. The next speaker is the new poster boy of conservation in Singapore. You saw him earlier on when uh, Major Tan Chuan Jin was speaking. He has uh, lots of accolades. Uh, Firstly, for rediscovering a number of rare mammals in Singapore. So I shall now pass on the next 10 minutes to Marcus Chua, who will enlighten you on mammal research in Singapore. Marcus, please. Hello, everyone. I'm Marcus from NUS, and I'm very excited to share with you uh, on the mammal research that has taken place in Singapore in the past and the present. So today, my talk will be something like uh, History Channel, uh, combined together with uh, a new flash update. So, mammal research uh, in the days of yore, how was it like? It all started with this man, right? uh, Stamford Raffles. The Stamford Raffles he was one of the first documented uh, modern uh, mammal researchers in Singapore. So other than uh, fi founding modern Singapore, Raffles was also a very keen naturalist. And in the early days, uh, naturalists were concerned uh, when it comes to Southeast Asia was that everything here was unknown. They do not know very much about the Southeast Asian fauna. And in Raffles' words, when he came to Singapore, one of the animals he saw was this large cream-colored giant squirrel the size of a cat. And what did he do? He shot it. <laughs> he shot it, he examined it, and he described it as a new species, uh, not new to science. And that was the cream-colored giant squirrel. However, unfortunately, uh, we've got no records of this species in the last 10 years in Singapore, now, right now. Right, in the past, due to the, the high diversity of uh, mammals in Singapore, um, other sorts of activities took place. So distance learning was uh, already taken place way before its uh, infection today. So what happened was that st uh, specimens were taken from Singapore and they were shipped to places as far away as uh, England. So the, the banded leaf monkey is one, one example. It was described um, in, in England from a specimen uh, taken from Singapore. Other examples included the slender squirrel which you can still find in our forest today. And because the draw of mammals is so great, even botanists would want to study them. Who wants to be a botanist when you can study mammals? <laughs> so, <laughs> an example would be, a very famous example would be uh, Ridley. So uh, uh, other than being known to be uh, the director of the Singapore Botanic Gardens, as well as bringing rubber, the rubber tree to Singapore, he was also noted for his uh, mam mammalian mammal observations. And he even has a bat, a leaf-nosed bat that's named after him. And uh, that, was, that was all uh, happening in the 1800s. In the 1900s, the Raffles Museum became an important site for uh, mammal research, mainly due to two people, uh, C, uh, Cecil Cross as well as uh, Frederick Nasser Chasen. They were the two ex-directors uh, of the Raffles Museum, and they contributed vastly to the mammal collection. We have got uh, over 30,000 uh, specimens of mammals in the Raffles Museum, mostly from Southeast Asia, and they contributed a lot to that. And other than that, their research culminated in the hand list of mammals on the right by Chasen. This is one of the large publications. So in the past, the questions were, what's out there? What is this? And by the 1900s, the questions developed into, um, how are these related? And what can you find where? So distribution was uh, a question that was answered. After that, trumpeting mammal research in universities was uh, Dr. John Harrison. He was the head of uh, zoology from the 1960s to 1970s, uh, to the start of 1971. 
and he was uh, he concentrated his study on small mammals, and he also uh, produced a book, uh, Introduction to Mammals of Singapore and Malaya. Also, at the same, pro same time, he trained many eminent um, uh, mammalogists, such as Lim Bouliet, if you know him. And he was also, he was also the father of Bernard Harrison, who is, uh, was the ex-CEO of Wildlife Research Singapore. So, however, mammal research is not only limited to scientists. So um, naturalists are interested in mammals as well, and some of them come together, led by uh, Subaraj, as well as some other, uh, a few other naturalists, and they form the Vertebrate Study Group, uh, which is part of the Nature Society of Singapore. Together, they got they surveyed um, Singapore for mammals, and they have made uh, significant discoveries and rediscoveries and new records of mammal species in Singapore. In fact, what we know currently about mammals in Singapore is mostly due to their surveys in the um, 90s. Also, they produced a book, Wild Animals of Singapore, this is part of their outreach effort, and which is wildly popular, and for the last I heard, it is all totally, it's almost sold out and out of print today, so get yours quickly. Right? So the next person our, uh, that, that is significant in mammal research in uh, the 90s is none other than, this person needs no introduction, but being a student of his, I will go on and talk about it anyway, so maybe give me five more minutes. So it's none other than Ottoman, um, Mr. Sivasoti. So he did his, um, his uh, first and foremost a man mangrove enthusiast, but he also did his uh, master's dissertation in NUS on Asian authors. So he had a paper on that as well. And he's also mentor and supervisor to many uh, memo researcher wannabes, including myself. And he's also one of the great um, advocators of studying roadkill, and this is him uh, dissecting a, uh, an author roadkill found just this year at West Coast. So, uh, this, this, this is a broad summary of the mammal research that has been uh, occurring in the past 200 years from Raffles to the 1990s. But what has happened? We've got a new breed of mammal researchers, the new, the warm, and the fuzzy. However, the mammal research that's happening now is slightly different, it's vastly different, from what has happened in the past. The questions are very different. Uh, first of all, the most important thing that a lot of things has changed. The most important thing is that the habitat has changed greatly. Uh, the habitat in the past, Singapore was mostly covered in primary rainforest, mangrove as well as swamp forest. This is a map of Singapore in 1819. But now, today, this is a map of Singapore just last year was created. You notice that the, the, rain, uh, the amount of forest has shrunk very uh, drastically. We have lost more than 95% of our original forest cover, and because of that, we have lost um, at least 71% of our mammal species. So with so much, such a huge losses, the questions naturally have changed. We are interested in finding out um, how are the mammals doing, how are the individual species doing, we know so little, and how we can conserve them, and how to avoid human-wildlife conflict today. How can we coexist better? So one of the trailblazers is uh, Norman Lim. He's uh, certain new territories since 2000. Right? He, he did his under, oh, in this section, I'm talking mostly about uh, NUS research. So I'm sorry if I leave out research going on in NPAC as well as WRS. So Norman did his undergraduate uh, research on the Malayan Kalugo, which we thought was once an endangered species. However, his research actually showed otherwise actually doing quite well in Singapore, which is good news. He stayed on in Singapore and did his master's dissertation on the Sunda pangolin, which is an internationally uh, threatened species. Now he's doing his PhD. He still, still has passion for mammals and he's doing his PhD on scavenger ecology in Singapore, uh, in Southeast Asia. Next, uh, I call her Monkey Girl. She does conduct monkey business in the, in, in the forest of Singapore. It's Andy Ang. She's the first rose among the thorns of mammal researchers in uh, Singapore. And she concentrated her work mostly on primates when she was an undergrad and went on to work on the banded leaf monkey in Singapore, which was thought to be one of the most endangered uh, mammal species in Singapore at one time. So she did work on the diet as well as on the population and genetics of the banded leaf monkey. And good news was that um, based on her estimates, her, her study, she recorded that the population of banded leaf monkey was at least 40 in 2010 compared to the estimate in 1990s was less than 20. This is good news as well. Right. Uh, mixed with myself, I shall not bore you too much with myself, but uh, I did my undergraduate work in Pulau Ubin, mainly on uh, the mammals of Pulau Ubin, 
and we were very glad to have found the mouse deer, the greater mouse deer, which was thought to be extinct as in, on Singapore as it has not been seen for over 80 years. After that, I tried to stay on, but um, met with a little bit of hiccups because uh, NUS um, isn't very supportive of um, master students. However, um, <laughs> I'm glad that um, my supervisors as well as um, uh, support my supervisors as well from the Wildlife Reserve Singapore Conservation Fund supported me uh, to do my masters in NUS and right now I'm going through the forest uh, through areas at night creeping around looking for leopard cats and finding out about their distribution, uh, population, diet as well as how to conserve them. And this picture which is, was shown just now, I didn't expect it to be shown at all. Uh, was, I'm smiling so widely because um, you notice the tree fall behind. This is, uh, I, I, use, use, I use camera traps for my studies. And this was a forest patch in Mandai which had massive tree fall in the beginning of the year. So I was worried that whether I could retrieve my cameras or not. But fortunately I went, went inside with one of my friends who guided me in. And all the trees around have fallen except for this tree which my camera trap was on. That's how I'm smiling so widely. Right, uh, but not all is doom and gloom for mammals in Singapore. Not everything is endangered. However, we've got two uh, ladies who are trying very hard to prevent the next species, the common palm civet, from being an endangered species. Right, this is she waiting, and she did her, her work on, at, on the common palm civet in Siglap, which and she, her, her work concentrated mainly on the ecology of the common palm civet, as well as trying how to avoid human wildlife conflict in this area. There's some, a small number of people do not want them to have, uh, around in their, in their houses. Uh, this is just a minority, and she's trying to overcome this. Carrying on her good work is Feng Su Kwan. Uh, we call her Civet Poop Girl because there's a very Civet Girl. So what she did was... Uh, <laughs> what she did was to find out um, for these urban civets that live in, in, in Siglap, is their ecology very different? And she found, yes, indeed, there is some difference. You can look at her posters outside. She, she'll tell you more about them. So essentially, she had to collect... Uh, she had to analyse the diet of the civet and had to collect poop and with that, she could uh, germinate the seeds and find out how viable they are. So she, she investigated on the ecology and um, the possibility of the civet being an urban uh, seed dispersal. Right, next. If you are a student of Ottoman and you naturally have to study otters and you'll be called Ottiger. So this is Meryl Singh. So she's, um, she's studying the ecology, the distribution and the status of the smooth-coated otters in Singapore. And very cute, this, this animal. And what she's trying to find out is uh, both their diet and trying to establish why have they disappeared from our Singapore waterways post-war and why are they slowly returning now? What is the cause? What is the reason for their disappearance? And if we want to see them coming back to Singapore, what should we do? What, is, what was the problem with, in the past that we should have to get rid of? Right? So she's compiling um, records of authors in Singapore and um, if you have any records you see of authors, please submit, submit to her, she's got author watch going on. Right, next, um, Memo Research in, uh, in NUS is so exciting, you know, I can't stop talking about it. So uh, we've got um, bird researchers that have been converted, uh, Amanda Tan studied red jungle fowls and now she's converted to study small mammals across the eco link. And uh, everybody likes a party but they don't want to clean up. So Ouyang Siu Ling is studying under Siva as well as Norman on the scavenger uh, community in, in, which includes mammals in Singapore forests. However, we don't just re limit our study of uh, mammals for wild animals. Um, May Ai Lian is studying community cats and obviously her study has implications on how to man better manage uh, cats in Singapore. Okay, the last slide I have here, uh, I left this for the last is because uh, this is sort of, sort of somewhat like uh, going back to our basics, like right? coming full circle. This is one species that have gone uh, locally extinct in Singapore in the past, the wild pigs, but they have made a comeback. In fact, uh, Red Lee made an observation about wild pigs in Singapore in the past, that they were raiding the orchards as well as plantations. To, and he also, at the same time, he made observations about the tiger, the deer, and the red giant flying squirrel. All of these have gone extinct, but this is the only species that seem to have come back. And, but however, although an old friend has come back, its predator is gone now, the tigers as well as the leopards. So uh, Salin, as well as Rachel, his predecessor, is trying to find out what is the ecology of, um, of the wild pigs in Singapore and what can we, what, how, how to better manage their population. He also has pig watch, so please submit your sightings of pigs, wild pigs, if you see any. Right. So this is a great time to study mammals right now in NUS, from the cherry faces we see down here, mainly because of the, of the 
the, pay, the waste that was paved by our predecessors. And what you can do is to, if you see any mammals casually, please report your sightings to Raffles Museum of Biodiversity Research or to the mammal researchers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus. Our next speaker, um, fellow teacher, uh, Dr. Adrian Lu, uh, he will tell us about. Uh, okay, for those of you who look at the abstract, his abstract has got quite an interesting title. It says, Kena Rotan. Uh, Kena Rotan, if I'm not wrong, my Malay is not that good. It means being hit by a rotan palm. Um, in Singapore, it's actually a, not a very, uh, uh, you can think about it like caning, okay? But uh, actually, he has a very interesting uh, pun here because if you added an L in kena, it becomes another word called kenal. Kenal in Malay means knowing something well. So Adrian Lu, he knows his Rotans well, and now he will spend the next 10 minutes telling you about palms in general uh, and some of the interesting discoveries and rediscoveries he has made about palms. Adrian, please. Hi, hi, everybody. How are you all? <laughs> okay. I'm especially nervous today because there's so many people and there are very important people in front, but heck. <laughs> um, it was actually very funny when I put the the RIA logo beside Kena Rotan. <laughs> but then you see Ottoman, right? He decided to take out the L from Kena, Kenal, to, uh, you know, and it became Kena Rotan. So in colloquial money, it means like you get cane. Every family has this cane that, you know, it gets handed down generation to generation. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this is actually uh, uh, comes from palms, a rattan. A rattan is a kind of climbing palm. And it's actually a real pity that we took out all the spines. Uh. So you see, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, I better not digress. Um, I'm going to talk about palms, and I'm going to talk about the native palms in Singapore and um, what we have discovered, the community, okay? And what does this mean for that? What does this mean for Singapore? Okay. Um, okay. To be fair to Ottoman. <laughs> Um, I did get whipped in the forest. <laughs> I mean, if you go um, in, in, in Bermuda's, right, you definitely will get squished by the rattan. I didn't know there was this pickle inside my leg until <laughs> I reached home. Then I decided to show it to my wife. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what well, I'm um, so if you know the coconut tree, right, you are not very far off. And then if you imagine, right, there's variations on the theme. Okay, you'll get these um, palms that are, are in Singapore. There are 54 species listed in Singapore, native species. 17 are presumed uh, extinct locally. Okay? And um, these are five of the different forms you'll get. Um, Nipa is a, where you get your Atapji from. Okay? Can eat one? Can. Okay? Um, Plectocomia is a giant rattan that you see in the forest. And uh, Likwala, you know, not all these palms have feather leaves, some of them have fan shaped leaves. Okay, and um, Ninga is a really beautiful understory palm. Okay, and uh, on the right there, you see a canopy forest palm. Okay, so the, for Oncosperma, right, you just imagine a, a coconut tree with a lot of spines thrown in. Okay, you don't want to be in a tree fall with Oncosperma. Okay, I'm going to highlight some palms here now. This is Cortelsia on the left. Okay, in Australia, it's called wait a minute because you know you get caught and then you say wait a minute. This is one of my students uh, waiting a minute. <laughs> yeah, and um, it, that is Cortelsia rostrata. It has a cirrus at the end. So, um, yep. That's Calamus insignis. So, if you see the, the whip that is coming out there, that is actually not from the leaf end, it's from the side, okay, for the sheath. So, that is a whip flagella. How apt, right? This is the rattan from hell. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm from Hugh Tan's lab, you know, so I was from the plant systematic lab. I'm like their grandfather. No, I'm like the, I'm like a big brother. Um, and Hugh Tan always say you need to clear the leaves huh, before you take the picture because Hugh Tan got very irritated with me. I just like to take pictures of them in their natural state. But then, you know, you try to clear the leaves. You know how it feels like to have spines inside your 
your fingernails. Yeah, you just clear the leaves. Uh. Yeah, it happened to me, right? And I, this is Hutan's fault. Where is he? <laughs> uh, but to be fair to this uh, rattan from hell, it has really very beautiful fruits. Rattans have these nice, beautiful, scaly fruits. Yeah. Uh, then this one is like, okay, like, let's up the ends a bit for the rattans. This is Demonorops by Demophila. If you see on the left there, you see the reddish stuff? That's a resin. That resin is called dragon's blood. Arr. <laughs> Okay, this is just some of the palms uh, you get. So, um, what is so significant about the biodiversity of palms in Singapore? Let's revisit an old tagline by Whitmore in um, Palms of Malaya. Okay, this table is a bit complicated. No? I showed my, staff, my, my colleagues yesterday, they said there's too much info, but I don't think it's too much info. So if you look at uh, Whitmore when he made that statement, right, there are many palms in Singapore as on the whole of mainland Africa. Okay, so um, he was right. Uh, there was 15 uh, genera only, and in Singapore there are 18 genera, but there are 50 species. But you know there has been a lot of active work in taxonomy and especially by the Kew Gardens team, and so it has changed. But hey, so now we have 16 genera, equal, all right, but they have about 20 more species. Okay, but still, I right, think about it, right? We are just a little red dot in mainland Africa, and we are not talking about Madagascar. So, I think we win. Uh. Yeah. But remember, uh, in this little red dot, right, there is a little green patch. Yeah, and the fact uh, was, um, came to me right, in a moment, you know. I've been working on Singapore flora for quite some time, but when I was trying to measure, right, map, I was mapping Ropaloblastis singaporeensis, a palm in Singapore, in the nature, Central Catchment Nature Reserve, right, what happened was, when I try to stretch this thing, uh, this five this five kilometer mark, right, to just estimate how how wide it was, right? And it's like five k. How many of you run the ten k m route? You can finish in one hour or something like that. It's really, really very small. Okay. So armed with this uh, sense of urgency, um, and she happened to have this book, so he threw it at me. I happen to have it here, you know, for some reason, it's like a Bible now. And then I, I started to put all these flags on the pages of all the native rattans here. It's been very helpful because when I go to the field, right, I, I can see what, I, I can identify them. Okay, so uh, I'm going to describe about what has been covered by the community. Okay, This is uh, discovered by the plant systematics lab, Ang Wee Fung, who <laughs> hopes to be like Hitan. God help him. <laughs> Where is he? Okay. Um, he discovered this pinanga. This pinanga is no taller than your knee and it's already mature and it fruits and flowers. Very, very beautiful. Okay. And he discovered it uh, in 2010, I think, February. And he discovered it on this of uh, Nisun Swang. On the opposite side, right? Just beside the car park. I happened to take pictures of this rattan and I stumbled upon this. Uh, big salak. Okay, you know the buah salak? This is a salak palm. And it turns out that it was listed as extinct as well. Okay, so it was very nice to rediscover this uh, palm. Okay, um, you might wonder why his cartoon is here. Tony O'Dempsey, I've never met him before, but I've seen him, I've seen him in cartoons. <laughs> He's Flora Singapura. Then I one day I met him in the herbarium and I said, hey, aren't you Tony O'Dempsey? And he said, yes. Then uh, we started talking. He said, hey, you know, Sunya Tio has uh, discovered something. Uh, this Folidocarpus kingianus, and it's listed as extinct also. Okay? So they rediscovered it. When I called her, I was quite afraid because I haven't spoken to her in such a long time. And then she said, hey, uh, Sunya, do you know who I am? I'm Adrian. And they said, oh, palm boy. Yeah. <laughs> then I like, oh, see, I got three kids here, yeah, palm men. Yeah. <laughs> So um, she, uh, she was describing uh, the length of the, the size of the tree leaf and all that. She was very excited, so it was really very interesting. And uh, this one is very weird because a lot of knowledgeable uh, botanists would know that it's actually around, but it's listed as extinct, so we need to update. So I'm getting my students to write a little paper to publish in Nature in Singapore. It's a wonderful uh, avenue to, to, to publish and to communicate. And this one is very special. Uh, Sean Lam's student 
Ling Ling, right, she actually stumbled upon this uh, palm in her research. And when she tried to key it out, right, I think she had some difficulty keying out to which species it is. Then we had a closer look, so she and I had a closer look, and then we got some one from Q to confirm the identity, and it turns out that it's never been recorded for Singapore. <laughs> and then I'm like, wow, alright, man, you know, like even the veritable, the honorable uh, HN really missed it out, you know. Really, uh, in every herbarium specimen you see his name. Okay, for the collections of Singapore, this one, someone missed it because it looks like another palm, but it's actually not, and you can tell from the the spines on the leaf and also some other characters. Uh. <laughs> and um, and um, what you and you can see where it's discovered. It's just there. Yeah, can you see the jogger there? No? Yeah, it's quite surprising. Uh. So uh, this is the summary. Don't have to see this already. So we actually changed the whole game. And now we have 41 extant species. Okay. So um, the moment I had, uh, I mean, like, what kind of insights can you have, right? So mine is very simple. It's not so cheap. It's like, wow, we are still discovering stuff. And wow, we are still a little red dot. And there's a little green patch behind. And it, is it vulnerable or not? So we better study this place well. You know what I mean? It's the only forest we have, and it's really, really very small. Okay? So that's, that's my deep insight. Uh. I try to think about it like one whole night. <laughs> 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 On the side note, right? I got rotan. <laughs> okay, on the side note, right? Uh, this is my teacher's day card. You know, one of the teachers, I get, I get, you know, all teachers get it, and then we just read it, and then secretly we bring it home, then we reread it again. <laughs> oh, then we feel the shock. <laughs> okay. So this one, uh, I don't know whether to press panic button or to be happy. So I was very happy then as I thought about it. I said. Ayo, you know, uh, they haven't really been exposed to ecology. It's not in their syllabus. Okay, so your next generation, right? Where is the next generation? They don't know anything, you know. Okay, yeah. So whatever you all do, right? I mean, the, the children are our future, lah. You want me to start singing song, lah? No, right? Okay, but yeah. <laughs> so I, I bring the students there, and then I, I show them the ends, and then I say, hey, you know, this rattan has ends inside. Then I say, hey, inside, the, if there are ants there, they might be farming scale insects. And true enough, we found the scale insect. And then when we keyed it down, it turns out to be an aphid. And then in all the literature, it's called a scale insect. Hey, you all have made a discovery. It's actually an aphid. Or oh, then you see the Eureka moment. Like, oh. Yeah, that is really great. So I leave you with a note from Tagore, 1933. Yeah, so you all can read, right? Yeah. Yeah, so we need to bring the children outside. Uh. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I know that the uh, hunger pangs in your stomach probably getting to many of you. So what we will do is uh, we will have a quick Q and A, hopefully. And uh, now I would like to re-invite the experts back up on stage. Okay, are you ready <laughs> to be grilled? Okay, uh, any of you here who have questions, please feel free to uh, approach any of the microphones at the uh, aisle and uh, throw out your questions.
Anyone from the ministry? Okay, to be fair to the syllabus at primary three, because I teach my son, he's uh, you know he needs to know reptiles, he needs to know birds, and he needs to know fish, and how to differentiate them, vertebrates and vertebrates. Uh. That's but at primary three, uh, and then he learns other things. But um, in in my class alone, uh, in my classroom teaching, I I I, I get students who say that um, you know um, well, I really I really miss biodiversity. I, I really wish I like David Attenborough, but you know, increasingly the the syllabus is becoming very molecular. Even when I teach, uh, if you see my students all nodding their heads, uh, yeah. So um, increasing, like even if you teach evolution, right, which is in the syllabus, but it's not molecular. Um, it's a lot of molecular evolution, homology, and all that. And I have trouble teaching them. Um, what is the difference between uh, you know uh, certain anatomical structures because they don't even know the animal uh. so uh, which is good for me because I spend like 10 minutes showing them at Tembra clips uh, and they're like whoa you know <laughs> yeah like as though they've seen it the first time yeah testing Jeff when you were talking about biodiversity you are referring to Local biodiversity or just biodiversity in with MOE curriculum people very often, uh, there is a, m a change in the syllabus for the humanities. Uh, most of us tend to think uh, biodiversity should come under the sciences, but in MOE system, apparently it somehow ends up in the humanities portion. Uh, I'm not sure your son is in P3, social they do social studies and a portion of social studies they talk about natural habitat. Yeah, so uh, in my own capacity, I've been working with them and it's slowly going in. <laughs> I think the um, introducing biodiversity has actually two components. One, whether biodiversity is included in the syllabus or not, that's one. And in the syllabus, then the next question is, are we teaching them about native biodiversity? Are we talking about rabbits and horses and whatever? So I think what we are trying to do is to try and convince the MOE. I think Karen has done a wonderful job in trying to convince them include in the humanities. The next step is, can we include in the sciences? And again, we're trying to say that, what's the point of learning about molecular stuff? And then you have all this gene and splice, one, two, three, whatever, all numerous. Like, and then they find, discover something, and then find that, I don't know what animal or plant it comes from. And if they do, then it's gone. It's not there anymore for them to tap. So I, I think that's the reason, the reason why we should actually include biodiversity into school curriculum and into you know everything else. So so that's a, so for us in Nampa. Uh, sorry, this is not a uh, advertisement forever. But uh, what what we are trying to do is maybe it is. Um, but what we are trying to do too is that um, uh, uh, it, it's important in this uh, about biodiversity is that um, we want to ensure that um, it's no point also telling the schools to actually 
teach biodiversity when we do not have enough information so someone asked a question about um, you know scientific data we need it for school syllabus we need it for school reference materials so that's one and so we have flora web fauna web on our mparts website so which gives people some idea about you know our biodiversity um, uh, rears website so so teachers can actually draw from resources because there's no point telling them teach 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 but it, we don't know anything about it where do we get the material so I, I think we all need to work together and we will continue to work on getting biodiversity into the school curriculum and plus ensure that they teach about native biodiversity because as you say we've got more um, uh, uh, palms uh, than Africa right <laughs> we can say about the same with other taxonomic groups too thanks comparable comparable okay thanks Thank you. Um, also, I want to add on a further point. As a teacher myself, uh, this is not advertisement for IP curriculum, but I have to put it in. Um, I echo the view of many of you because when I teach my students and bring them out on field trips, uh, whenever they see eagles, they will shout, oh, that's a bald eagle. And I'll say, no, 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 that's not a bald eagle. You know, this is a white-bellied sea eagle. And, um, the problem is that uh, the media actually is constantly exposing our students with a lot of information from all over the world. Uh, and unfortunately, Singapore's biodiversity does not get that much media attention if you compare it to, say, uh, Serengeti or Great Barrier Reef. Uh, so what in IP we could do is that because we have a little more autonomy from the government, we take over uh, some of our things we cover in the curriculum and uh, for us, uh, what I try to do for my students is to introduce local biodiversity into examples. So I gave them a food chain recently in a test. They had to uh, understand the food chain and food web that made up Bukit Timah. So they had to look at local examples, cream banded bubbles, rattans, uh, local butterflies. Uh, and I'm hoping to use this as an avenue to get them uh, interested in what we have on our own shores. Thank you. Uh, we have another question Can here. Okay. <laughs> I knew that another educator would be interested. That's Beng Chak. Hi, I'm Martha. And I teach here locally at an international school. And so to address uh, um, your concern about uh, injecting biodiversity education in schools, I teach a course, um, it's sort of equivalent to an A-level. It's called AP Environmental Science. This is something I would, I would encourage Singapore to consider. The, Curriculum is written by the College Board in the United States, and it's a science-based course, so it's not in the humanities. Purposefully, it's not called environmental studies, but environmental science. The students learn ecology principles in depth, and of course, biodiversity concepts and species richness in depth. But as well, they learn policy uh, analysis, uh, management, risk, um, pollution, toxicity, they uh, go out in the field, we take them to TMN, and these are 17, 18-year-olds 18 who may not go on in environmental science or science at all, although they might be very important members of community because they come from influential families. But I've heard from the graduates from the program that are in university that this is the single most important education that they've received while in, undergrad while in high school because it broadens their understanding of the interconnection between ecosystems, biodiversity, richness, the importance of the services that the environment provides, the importance for conservation, how to go about conservation, humanitarian issues together with environmental issues married together. So whether they become engineers or politicians or artists or doctors, this sets their ethic code and I cannot tell you how important it is to have this in Singaporean schools. So I agree with you, and I'm not sure whether the MOE is the place to start or whether Tan Tang Chek, uh, starting well program after school and co-curricular and the people who, like Vilma de Rosario, who are teaching young children, that that co-curricular element is there and strong in Singapore. But I do agree with you that there are good programs that Singaporean children can avail of, even if they go into molecular genetics, that will assist in their ethics changing so they can be better decision makers in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martha. 
Hi, um, I'm Bing Chuck, and um, maybe I'll just quickly say that it is what the minister said just now. It is about Singapore, because we know in terms of economic development, I see as a biology teacher all these years that the biology syllabus has moved from molecular slant because it is a trust that the ministry wants or the Singapore wants. And you can see from like, if I were to ask how many of you are on scholarship and what kind of scholarship as a teacher we give to let our students know it's always A star scholarship. So as a, is, do we even ever give biodiversity scholarship, that kind of money that A star has to give up scholarship? I mean, you hear Marcus saying that he doesn't get enough scholarship to do his studies. <laughs> so as long as the Singapore government do not see this as a trust, then it's very difficult. The syllabus in the ministry takes five years to reform, and we still use Cambridge. Teachers do not set question to, to clarify Jack's question. We um, O level syllabus and A level syllabus, the question comes from Cambridge. So the ministry will sort of um, together with them, right, um, um, Adrian, they will suggest topics that we want to do for H3 for A levels, but in O level it is still a traditional curriculum which is slant now, unfortunately, towards molecular side because this is the direction that the country wants to move towards. So as long as our community do not think that there's a need to raise biodiversity, it's very difficult for the ministry want to do so, that's one. But on the other side, the good news is there's this strong movement that's not official. That I mean, here we are, all of us, doing like what Ria is doing. This movement that's from the people is much stronger than when I was a student in this school, I'm a product of NUS. And if you ask me how my contemporary, how many of them actually are now actively involved in biodiversity, I don't see not, not a lot. But we are a part of a, a biology system in this school, in NUS. So I think the movement, I mean, in terms of civil movement, it is, it's a really a positive movement. So there's change happening, and I think I'm optimist. I feel that the change will come. If we continue to speak up, Ria is perfectly right. We need to express ourselves. We need to go to the right channel and says that we want a change, we want a balance, we do not want all molecular thing. We're an Asian student that's able to do molecular stuff and also still have a strong foundation of evolution and biodiversity that's kudos to his work. And I'm quite sure as educators, if we speak louder, our community will also do what the Singapore American schools are doing. Thank you. Well, that Um, due to time constraints, I guess we will take uh, one to two more questions before uh, going for our lunch break. Uh, let's have, uh, yes, please. Okay, my uh, question here is directed towards Ms. Delphin Tan. It's uh, regarding the Ecolink. Now, I understand that the purpose of the link is supposed to allow for animal movements between like, the two catchment reserves, but I do have concerns about its effectiveness. I mean, because it is, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it is my assumption that these animals which are trying to help are generally the more shy ones, which stay in the interior of the forest, away from human beings. So if you build an eco-link above a busy expressway with hundreds, thousands of cars passing underneath it each day, with making so much noise, would the animals even want to use it? And on a related note, will this eco-link, when it's built, be strictly off-limits to the public? Um, actually, the animals like uh, like I showed you, the pangolins and uh, mouse and all of those, they actually are trying to cross the roads, so they, uh, that's why they become roadkill. So that would actually allow them to cross safely. Um, also, the ecolink would be built up with uh, with planted with uh, forest species and forest species plants to make it more uh, safe and enticing for animals to cross. Uh, and at the same time, not too enticing, so they'll actually stay on the equally. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, as to uh, humans, unfortunately, humans, uh, people in Singapore, do like to go where they want to go. Um, even in the central nature reserves, where they're not supposed to have uh, people going there and poaching things, there are people fishing. Uh, so. If we don't make a path for them, they will make their own path. 
So uh, at the moment, the plan I think is to just make it uh, when it's open to public, it'll be for guided walks. So that would minimize uh, people going in. All right. Thank you. Shall we have one last question? very much. Okay, one last comment. So, um, yeah, I recently graduated from junior college, so I'm quite aware of what goes on in curriculum. I don't deny that um, in kindergartens and primary schools, there are a lot of education movement now. Um, I know like Vilma and Grace and a lot of um, educators, they are bringing kids out more often. But the thing is, after primary school, after that biodiversity syllabus, in secondary school and junior college, or polytechnic, wherever they go, is where the, it stops. Yeah, it stops. So um, I was fortunate enough to be in an integrated program. So we did have some um, ecology field work. But it's a lot of work to sustain it on our own, because we have to do it in CCAs or volunteering outside. We have very little curriculum support. So the thing is more of um, higher level education than in primary schools. I mean, primary schools do start it and you know generate that passion and everything, but there is no continuation of support in secondary school and junior college, which is where the problem lies. Then when it comes to NUS, you have that whole whoa mammals and everything again. So I'm just saying my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just respond to that? In two years' time, there will be in the secondary school. In two years' time, yeah. Uh, Karen is in the know. <laughs> <laughs> they are starting field work packages uh, where children have to go out and be outdoors and learn from from the outdoors. So yeah, there will be. Okay, with that, let's give our speakers another round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, before you leave, I have two announcements to make. The first one is, uh, since we are um, letting you off a bit later, uh, please try and come back by 1.10. Okay, the second announcement is, um, you know the big uh, Singapore uh, Biodiversity Encyclopedia? The very thick one that was just released recently. Uh, it's selling at the co-op uh, with a 10% discount. 
Uh, the only catch is that the co-op closes at one o'clock. <laughs> Okay, so if you do want to get your copy, uh, there will be a 10% discount at the co-op just for today only for, for you guys. Okay, thank you very much.